Hey guys, in this video I'm going to talk about two California mushrooms and some interesting biology associated with them. Those are Amanita villosa, the springtime Amanita, and Amanita phylloides, the death cap. Amanita villosa is regarded by many mushroom hunters as one of the best tasting mushrooms around. Personally, I think it's a little overrated. And Amanita phylloides is one of several species that contain a particularly toxic class of compounds called amatoxins, which are responsible for the majority of mushroom-related deaths in the U.S., and among all amatoxin-containing mushrooms, Amanita phylloides is by far the most frequently responsible. Amanita phylloides generally shows up from August to January, whereas Amanita villosa is most common in January to May. Amanita phylloides has many of the typical features of Amanitas. It has a vulva, the enlarged sac at the base. The stipe is often slightly tapered and typically white, but sometimes cream or yellowish. The cap color is quite variable. Occasionally they can be almost totally white, but more often they have a sickly yellowish green color, which I find quite distinctive. It has white spores and tightly packed white gills that sometimes become off-white with age. The gills are lightly attached or free, meaning they don't touch or they barely touch the stipe. And like many Amanitas, it often has the remnants of a partial veil, which is the thin membrane that covers the gills in the early stages of development. Some people say Amanita phylloides has a distinctive smell. Personally, I think they have very little odor. They don't change color when they're bruised, and they generally have a solid stipe. Amanita phylloides contains two interesting classes of toxins, amatoxins and phallotoxins. Both classes are bicyclic oligopeptides. Oligopeptides, like proteins, are polypeptides, meaning they're composed of chains of amino acids. But oligopeptides refers to short polypeptides, generally less than about 40 or 50 amino acids in length. Amatoxins are octopeptides, being composed of 8 amino acids, and phallotoxins are heptapeptides, being composed of 7 amino acids. Bicyclic means the molecules have two rings in their structure, something which is a relatively uncommon feature in most proteins. Amatoxins and phallotoxins are both members of the MS-DIN toxin family, named after the highly conserved methionine, serine, aspartic acid, isoleucine, asparagine sequence found in members of this toxin family. Of the amatoxins found in Amanita phylloides, alpha-amanitin is probably the most well-studied and the most toxic. The oral LD50 of alpha-amanitin is 100 micrograms per kilogram for rats, the LD50 being the dose needed to kill half the subjects. Assuming the same toxicity in humans, the LD50 of a typical 80 kg adult would be 8 mg, less than a third the mass of a grain of rice. Amatoxins are potent inhibitors of RNA polymerase II, a multiprotein complex responsible for transcribing DNA into various types of RNA, including messenger RNA, small nuclear RNA, and microRNA, all of which are crucial for normal cell function. Messenger RNA, or mRNA, serves as the instruction set the ribosome uses to synthesize new proteins, something which is necessary to replace the proteins being constantly degraded and to make new proteins as conditions change. Small nuclear RNA, or snRNA, together with other proteins, forms small nuclear riboproteins, SNRPs, in the nucleus of cells, which are themselves part of a larger protein complex called the spliceosome. The spliceosome processes mRNA by removing the non-coding sections called introns and stitching together the coding sequences called exons. This process enables alternative splicing, where one gene, which encodes one immature mRNA, can be processed into multiple mature mRNAs and thus produce multiple protein variants called isoforms. This allows for mutations that result in novel isoforms while still producing the wild-type protein as well. However, in addition to allowing genetic flexibility, alternative splicing is implicated in a number of genetic diseases. One example of this is familial dysautonomia, which results from the skipping of exon 20 of the IKB-CAP gene. That gene includes the ICAP protein, which is critical for neuronal development. Without exon 20, the ICAP protein is non-functional, and sensory and autonomic neurons fail to develop properly. Autonomic neurons are responsible for controlling unconscious bodily functions, and individuals with familial dysautonomia have symptoms including insensitivity to pain, inability to produce tears, frequent vomiting crises, unstable blood pressure, and disrupted perception of taste and heat, among many others. 
microRNA enables another layer of control by regulating the abundance of mRNA. MicroRNA acts as a guide in the RNA-induced silencing complex, RISC, where it binds to mRNA with a complementary sequence. Once the target mRNA is recognized, RISC can degrade the mRNA, thereby preventing it from being translated into protein. Exploiting this regulatory mechanism as a therapy has been a source of interest, and a number of microRNA-related drugs have entered clinical trials, though none have yet been approved. Some therapeutic approaches include designing synthetic microRNA constructs that suppress the ability of cancer to produce key proteins, as well as designing anti-microRNA oligonucleotides, which are synthetic molecules that bind to and neutralize naturally produced microRNAs in order to upregulate a gene product. Back to the amatoxins. Amatoxins are primarily hepatotoxic, meaning they damage the liver, though symptoms can take 18 to 24 hours to appear, or even longer. Liver damage from ingesting Amanita phylloides is often so severe that a liver transplant is required. There are several drugs used to treat cases of amatoxin poisoning, such as N-acetylcysteine, which is expected to reduce liver injury, and silymarin, which is thought to reduce the uptake of amatoxin into the liver, but the efficacy of all these drugs is quite limited, and there is no antidote to amatoxin. Of the phallotoxins present in Amanita phylloides, phalloidin is the most well studied. It has an oral LD50 of 5 mg per kilogram, 50 times higher than alpha amanitin, mainly because it's poorly absorbed by the gut. So while phallotoxins are responsible for some of the symptoms of Amanita phylloides poisoning, they're not the primary drivers of lethality. Nonetheless, they have some interesting properties. The toxicity of phalloidin is due to its ability to strongly bind filamentous actin, F-actin, and prevent its depolymerization. Actin is a protein that composes chains called microfilaments, Along with intermediate filaments and microtubules, microfilaments form the site of skeleton, the dynamic network that gives cells their rigidity, ability to change shape, as well as forming a network along which organelles and cellular materials can be transported. The dynamic aspect of the cytoskeleton is that it's constantly being remodeled. Globular actin proteins are constantly being polymerized to form chains of filamentous actin, and then depolymerized back into globular actin. This process allows cells to move, divide, and respond to mechanical stress. Phalloidin binds to the F-actin between the subunits and prevents depolymerization, effectively paralyzing the cytoskeleton. This high affinity for F-actin has been useful for cell biology. By treating cells with fluorescently labeled phalloidin, we can visualize the actin networks with high resolution. Both amatoxins and phallotoxins are heat-stable, so cooking the mushrooms doesn't diminish their toxicity, and individuals who consume Amanita phylloides generally report that they taste good. Typically, 6 to 12 hours after ingestion, patients present with nausea, abdominal cramps, watery diarrhea, and dehydration. This gastrointestinal distress appears to be due to phallotoxins. The gastrointestinal symptoms generally disappear within a few hours of appearing. Meanwhile, the liver is being damaged by the amatoxins, which doesn't result in obvious symptoms until at least 24 hours after ingestion. At that point, evidence of liver injury appears in the form of elevated liver transaminases and bilirubin. In healthy liver tissue, transaminases degrade amino acids as part of normal metabolism. When the liver tissue is injured, the cells rupture and release transaminases into the blood. Bilirubin is normally produced in the liver as an intermediate step in the recycling of red blood cells. Specifically, it's derived from the heme portion of hemoglobin molecules, which carry oxygen. As the liver is damaged, it can no longer effectively process the bilirubin, and it accumulates in the blood. If the individual consumed a significant amount of Amanita phylloides, they'll progress to total liver failure over the next three to seven days, requiring a liver transplant, or else death. Of 147 reported cases of amatoxin, 11% were fatal, making it by far the most lethal mushroom on an overall and per case basis. Genetic studies indicate that Amanita phylloides was introduced to the United States from Europe several times, most likely when European saplings were brought to the United States. Amanita phylloides has since become widespread in California and continues to rapidly extend its range. As a result, it's considered invasive by many mycologists. One interesting factor, which may have contributed to this spread, is the unusual ability of some California populations of Amanita phylloides to reproduce bisexually and unisexually, whereas virtually all other mushrooms can only reproduce bisexually. To understand what this means, we have to understand how Basidiomycete reproduction works. 
Just about every fungi you would recognize as a mushroom, with the exception of morels, are basidiomycetes. Morels and other sac fungi, as well as yeasts and common molds, are ascomycetes. Mushrooms are the fruiting bodies of basidiomycetes. They're produced by the fungal mycelium which colonizes its chosen substrate, whether that's decaying organic matter, the roots of a tree, or anything else. The purpose of the mushroom is to produce and disperse spores. The mature mycelium and the mushroom itself are diploid, meaning like humans they have two sets of chromosomes. The spores, like sperm and eggs, are haploid, meaning they have only one set of chromosomes. But rather than being different cell types, spores exist as either plus or minus mating types. The spores are produced on the mushroom's gills in structures called basidia, and then drop to the ground or are carried by air currents. Those spores can germinate and produce haploid mycelium with either the plus or minus mating type. When two spores of opposite mating types germinate next to each other, they can fuse to produce diploid mycelium and the cycle repeats. Although the diploid mycelium contains the two sets of chromosomes, the haploid nuclei themselves remain separate entities in each cell, only fusing briefly into a single nuclei just before spore formation. Typically, if haploid mycelium fails to fuse with another haploid mycelium of opposite mating type, it will be unable to successfully produce mushrooms or new spores. However, populations of Amanita phylloides in California have been found that can grow and produce viable fruiting bodies without opposite mating types. It's not clear if these mycelia are truly haploid or the result of the fusion of two haploid mycelia with identical mating types. Regardless, this unusual behavior seems to have contributed to the rapid spread of Amanita phylloides in California. So this here is Amanita villosa, also known as the springtime Amanita, and it's a choice edible Amanita that starts coming up in late January, February, at least here in California. Um, some of the defining characteristics it tends to have this uh, light brown cappuccino colored cap and has the remnants of the veil here similar to uh, other Amanitas like Amanita calyptroderma um, but it's not quite as thick usually also has striations along the edge here and of course white gills and the enlarged base like all Amanitas do This one looks like it's in pretty good condition. The habitat for Amanita villosa tends to be around coast live oak. You can see this is all oak duff. I usually find them about 15 to 20 feet away from the base of the oaks. And they tend to like um, a little bit of kind of clearings. See here there's like mixed grass, but otherwise there's not a huge amount of ground cover. That's pretty typical. One of the other things about Amanita villosa is when it's fresh, it doesn't really have much smell. But if you find an older specimen that's more dried out, it tends to get a kind of fishy odor. We've got the coast live oak here, and then right at the base, some nice Amanitas. That's a real pretty one. Look at that. There's one right next to it, too. Ooh. Very nice. They kind of have a little bit of a bronze color. Or maybe peach. When they're young. Look at that. There's another one right there. This one's a little older. And there's one right here. Nice. These are a little on the smaller side, I would say. Alright, so I picked these guys in just about two or three minutes, all in the same area. Probably only a couple of them are really worth taking. It's pretty dry out and the bugs are already on them. Here's a really nice one.
very cottony vulva remnants here striations You can see here one of the other features of Amanita villosa that distinguishes it from Amanita ocreata and phylloides, which is that it has a hollow or pith-filled center of the stipe. As you can see here. So this is very soft. So with these velosas, I washed them, boiled them for about 8 minutes, and then served them with some ramen, which is a good way to prepare a lot of mushrooms, but in the case of these velosas, it kind of ruined them. In the past, I've prepared them by sautéing them with some butter until they're nice and brown, and I definitely think that's a much better way to prepare these mushrooms. Okay, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.